Today I want to share with you uh, briefly uh, the message of the hope of Christmas. Scripture reading for the text was done by Sandy as she read for us in, in uh, Luke chapter 1 verses 33 and uh, 31 to 33 uh, moments ago. And, uh, and also, uh, first text I'm going to turn to, uh, if you want to turn to your Bibles to be ready for that, is Matthew chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. And if you think about it, it's entirely appropriate for Jesus Christ, who is the hope of the world, to have come as a baby. To come in the form of an infant. Because of anything that's in the creation world is, is, is a newborn, is a baby, and that baby's life is hope personified. They have pure potential. Their future is in front of them. And who of us have not looked at a baby or held a baby and reflected and thought for just a few moments about wondering, wow, I wonder what this life will become. Will it be a, will it be a, a surgeon that will save people's lives? Will it, will it be a, a person that makes a difference in other people's lives? Probably most of us do not think, well, here's a crook. We don't think about things like we think about the pure potential of what of what 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 goodness can come from this newborn life. You know, at that point in time we, we realize anything is possible. But Mary had even more than that usual motherly maternal pride in having great hope for her son. She had been visited by that angel Gabriel that Sandy wrote, read for us just a few moments ago and gave her the promise. And then the promise was echoed by Isaiah and his prophecy. Not only that, but over in Matthew chapter 1, verse 20, Joseph, Mary's husband, had also received a promise. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. In other words, when Jesus was born, God made it very clear that this baby was the one for whom the world had been waiting. And they, he was the one that the world had been watching for, had been hoping for, ever since the first man and woman had been driven out of the Garden of Eden. God had promised a Savior, a Deliverer, a King. And what joy must have filled Mary and Joseph's hearts as they looked down at their son, wrapped in the blankets there, lying in that ordinary manger, filled there with the straw, surrounded by the different animals. But just think about what hope was knowing that one day this child was the one that all of God's promises was going to be fulfilled through this infant. Looking at that child and knowing that he was the one in whom God's people was going to find forgiveness of their sins. Looking at this child and knowing that he was the one in whom they would find true and lasting peace. And it must have been somewhat overwhelming as they considered the awesome responsibility God had just placed in their laps, in their arms, to raise this newborn. And I mention all of this because it really highlights a very important fact about our faith. Our faith is a faith of hope. It's a faith that looks forward to the future. It's a faith that looks to the time when God's promises is going to be fulfilled. Now that was true for God's people prior to Jesus' birth as they look forward to the Messiah. It was true for Mary and Joseph as they looked down at their newborn son. And it's true for us today as we anticipate 
the second advent, the second coming of Christ. Our faith is a future-focused faith of what is yet to come. It is a faith of hope. Now, that doesn't mean our faith has no relevance to our daily lives right now. We just can't always live, well, one of these days, one of these, far from it. We, we live in the daily here and now part of life. Matter of fact, the Christian faith is intensely practical. But what it does mean is that here and now is not our only focus. We also have a hope in the future as well, too. Paul wrote in Colossians, If you then have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. Our focus is on the world to come, but in a very paradoxical way, it's our future focus that allows us to live the life that we live today. We can live a life of hope, we can live a life of faith, even in spite of the trials and the tribulations that come, because we know we have a future that has been planned and God has prepared for us. And like we say from time to time, we'll understand it better by and by. Now that would be the end of the sermon if it weren't for one thing. Hope is not automatic. In fact, sometimes hope is very difficult. Sometimes our circumstances seem anything but hopeful. In fact, sometimes they can seem all but hopeless. How do we sustain hope in the midst of disappointment and difficulty? How do we keep from being completely overwhelmed by trials and pain? How do we maintain an attitude of hope when everything in us wants to yield to despair and to to give up sometimes? When, When we can't see a way out, when we want to give up, how do, we, how do we push through? A couple of things I want to share with you today. And the first thing is, put your hope in God. Trust Him for your help. Now, to this group sitting here this morning, that seems pretty obvious, doesn't it? This is not something you've heard for the very first time. But too often we are willing to seek help from anyone and anything before we turn to God. Sometimes he's our last resort to appeal. And then after we've exhausted every other option, we go to God. We'll try everything we can think of. And if nothing else works, we'll think, okay, it's time to pray now. Nothing else seems to be working. But that's backwards. We should go to God first, not last. Listen to what the the psalmist wrote in Psalm chapter 33. The king is not saved by his great army. A warrior is not delivered by his great strength. The war horse is a false hope for salvation. By its great might it cannot rescue. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those whose hope in his steadfast love that he may deliver their soul from death and keep them alive in famine. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help, our shield. Our heart is glad in him because we trust in his holy name. Let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us, even as we hope in you. What's the psalmist saying? He's not saying, well, the king shouldn't have armies. The king shouldn't have a warrior, shouldn't ride on horses. He's saying that even... If a king has a large, well-equipped army, it can't guarantee success. It's relying, if he's relying on that victory, if his hope is in those things, he'll be defeated. The psalmist is saying our hope should be in God. And when we place our hope in God, it pleases him. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope in his steadfast love, that he may deliver their soul from death. Now here's the question. 
when you're in a situation where your hope is running low, what do you do first? Do you sort of rack your brain first? All right, what am I going to have to do to solve this problem? Or do you begin to think about who are some people that can help me? What resources do I need? Uh, what kind of plans do I need to put in place? What kind of strategy do I need to be working home on? So the question is, where is prayer in the process of seeking hope in the middle of tough times? Well, here's the answer. Here's what to do. Got your pens and paper out? Write this down. Just stop what you're doing and pray. You may say something like this, Lord, I don't know what to do. I'm not sure how to handle this, but my trust and my hope are in you. I'm relying on you to resolve this situation. Please show me what you would have me to do. Amen. That's the prayer. And you bring those things before God. You know what's going to happen if you do that? Well, I can guarantee you nothing bad's going to happen. Nothing unpleasant. Nothing painful. Well, that, can I guarantee that? Really, honestly, I can't. But I can guarantee this. Our hope is in God. And God will prove himself faithful to you and he will not disappoint you and you will not regret trusting and putting your hope in God. I have had no one say to me, I regret that I trusted and put my hope in God. Now, that doesn't mean the outcome comes the way you want it to come out. We can't guarantee that. You see, our hope is in not what we hope God will do. Our hope is in not one specific result. Our hope is in God himself. And when we do what is best and we trust him to do what is best, he will come through and he will make a difference. The prophet Isaiah wrote, Then you will know that I am the Lord, those who wait on me for shall not be put to shame. Lamentations. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, for the soul who seeks him. And in Psalms, the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him and those who hope in his steadfast love. Now here's one word of caution. And many of us have experienced this and we know it from experience. God's goodness and wisdom are not always immediately evident. Sometimes it's only looking back in retrospect that we can see how God has been carrying us, how God has been providing for us, and how God protected us. Sometimes when we're right in the thick of things, it's oftentimes pretty hard to see how God is even working sometimes. But if we continue to trust Him, if we continue to place our hope in Him alone, we will not be disappointed. So where does this kind of hope come from? You know, reality check here. It's, it's one thing to say, put your hope in God. It's another thing to actually do it, especially when you're under great pressure and the circumstances look hopeless. Where do we get the faith to do this when we need to do this? This is what Paul wrote to the church at Rome. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. We get this kind of faith from God. We go to Him to get the faith we need to place our hope in him. He supplies the strength, the perseverance, the willingness to keep pushing on. Now one way to develop an attitude of hope is 
is really to begin to think about all the promises of God. The more, the more you fill your heart and your mind with the thoughts of the life to come, the future that we have, the less the sorrows and the disappointments of this life will disturb your own peace of mind. That's how Paul was able to write in Romans. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. The more we focus on the blessings and the glory of the life to come, the less burdensome our current problems will seem by comparison. You, uh, you read over in the book of 2 Corinthians, Paul writes about being whipped, about being beaten, about being shipwrecked, about all kinds of persecution. And then he says, in comparison to what that has gone through, that's nothing in comparison to what God has planned for me in the future. And things can look oftentimes so hopeless for us. But God has a plan. And when we focus on the blessings and the glory of what, what his plan is for our lives, therein we can find hope. Paul was able to call these light and momentary troubles, and he wasn't exaggerating. He went through hard times. But the problem for us isn't that we think too much of our current problems, but here's our main problem, I think. We think too little of what God has planned for us. We just, we just think about what's there. And we forget to think about what God has already put in place for us. Folks, as the choir saying, we are a people saved by grace. And that gives us hope. We sing about, this, about that Calvary and the price that was paid there for us. That gives us hope. And we are a people In spite of everything going on around us, we should be living a life filled with hope. It's not easy. We all struggle with that. But God has provided a way for us as we focus on what his plan is. I love the little chorus that we sang as the choir was going down. My life is in you, Lord. My strength is in you, Lord. My hope is in you, Lord. Then that little line farther down in that song, he said, all of my hope is in you. Can you say that this morning? That my hope is in God. It's not in the politicians. It's not in the resources I can muster and put together for my life. It's not even in my family as much as we love them. God, my hope is in you because you have a plan for my future. And Father, you have a plan to see me through whatever turmoils this life throws at me. I place my hope in you. Marilyn played for us at the offertory, Do You Know My Jesus? Do you know him? That's where you find hope. That's where you place your trust in. Let me ask you this today as we close. Are you trusting him now? Not trusting in your own smarts or your own way of things you can do. Or are you trusting in him? Do you know him today? We invite you this morning if, to come and trust him if you've never done that. You can do it right where, you, right where you stand. Matter of fact, we invite you to fill out one of those connection cards. If you're making a decision to trust Christ, fill that out, give it to us. We want to pray with you and we want to follow up with you to help you grow in that walk with him so you can really understand what we, what we talk about when we talk about the hope of the future. God has such a marvelous plan for those 
who place their faith and trust in Him. Wouldn't you want, wouldn't you want to do that today? Or maybe you're here this morning and you're a Christ follower, you're a believer, and you're just sort of struggling. Man, life has thrown some rocks at you. And some days it's just hard to put one step in front of the other. A lot of us has been there. So nothing to be ashamed of. But what is to be ashamed of if you're a Christ follower? And I'm not trying to be mean, but what's, what, is, what is real difficult is if you decide that's where you're going to stay because God's got something better. If you place your faith and your hope in Him, you can get beyond that. Maybe not tomorrow, maybe not next week, but as you live out your life, you will be able to look back and see how God took care of you because you placed your faith and your hope and your trust in Him. We invite you this morning just to come to Him and say, God, here it is. Everything I've tried is not working. I give it to you. And maybe this morning it's a time of, uh, you know what, I want to become part of a church family. We invite you to come explore, see what it means to walk with us as a family in Green Valley Baptist Church. But the most important decision you will make, whether you're a Christ follower, whether you are a person yet to come to Christ, that you'll make the decision as of today, I am going to follow Jesus. That is where my hope is found. Pray with me. Father, in these moments, I pray that uh, your Holy Spirit will continue to work. I know, Father, in my own efforts, sometimes come up short. But, Father, your Holy Spirit works in so many different ways, and we trust Him to move in our midst move us to the point of commitment, of decision, of yielding, and of saying, I place my hope in you, God. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.